Hello, everybody, and welcome to our JBF Industry Support Webinar, The Feed Act is Back. My name is Ashley Koziak. I am the Impact Program Manager uh, at the James Beard Foundation, and I'm going to be helping facilitate this conversation today with some really wonderful panelists who have great expertise on the FEED Act. But before we get into that, I'm gonna go over some sort of house rules, ground rules, parameters for the webinar. If you've joined us before, all of this will be very familiar. First, this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss any portion of this or you like it so much you wanna rewatch it or share it with a friend, those links will be available uh, by next week. And you'll be able to find that all on our website, openforgood.com as well as all of our past webinars as well, and you'll be able to register for future webinars. We will field questions as time allows. We'll try to get to most of those at the end, but you know we'll be keeping an eye on that. If you wanna submit a question, you can write in your question at any time. So even though we'll be getting to most of the questions at the end, as soon as a question occurs to you, go ahead and send that in so that if it makes sense to incorporate that into the, the you know, the larger panel and dialogue will certainly try to do that. You'll see a little question icon on your screen. It almost looks like a little message uh, message box with a question mark in it. That's how you submit a question and we will do our best to get to it. If you're having any technical difficulties, oftentimes the best fix is to log off and log back on. But if you are running into technical issues, send us a message and my colleague Cecilia or Megan will do our best to help troubleshoot with you. Unfortunately, we don't have GoToWebinar staff on hand, um, but we've been doing this for long enough that hopefully we'll be able to help assist with any questions that you might have. Uh, so with that, let's, let's get on to our amazing panel here. So I'm gonna start by introducing the panel and then we'll you know, kind of go through the conversation. Uh, so our panelists are, we have Nate Mook, who is the CEO of World Central Kitchen. Monica Gonzalez, who is the Director of Federal and Government Relations for Share Our Strength, No Kid Hungry. Nate Bentham, who is the Legislative Assistant to Congressman Thompson. And Patrick Mulvaney, who is the chef and owner at uh, Mulvaney's b &L. So thank you everyone so much for joining us today. It's great to have you. So this first question is just to kind of let our audience, let our attendees get to know each of you a little bit better. Uh, and so it's, I'd love for each of you to share a bit about your organization or your business, what your priorities were before the pandemic, and a bit of how these priorities might have shifted in 2020 into 2021. And we're just going to go down, go down the line. So we're going to go Monica Gonzalez, Patrick Mulvaney, Nate Bentham, and Nate Mook. So if I could ask you to each talk about your organizational priorities then and now. Yeah, sure. Um, Ashley, first, let me thank you for having us on this panel and for the work that the James Beard Foundation has been doing during this time. And also just want to, um, you know, as we're talking about the Feed Act, just want to thank um, Nate and um, Betham and Congressman um, Mike Thompson for his leadership on this particular issue. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of Share Our Strength, you know, we're an organization that's focused on feeding children and addressing childhood hunger. Um, and we do that through our No Kid Hungry campaign. Um, for us, our priorities really did not change. Um, we're always focused on how we can best feed children um, through times where they're not as challenging as they are today. You know, prior to the pandemic, one in seven children were. Um, facing the threat of hunger, we were making progress, and all of that has been erased. Now, today, it's one in four children. So for us, our mission doesn't change. We will continue to advocate and fight hard, and we will continue to work with everyone who wants to work with us to help us feed kids. Um, so for us, that has not changed. And I'm Patrick Mulvaney. Uh, our restaurant is here in Sacramento uh, Valley surrounded by farms and our whatever comes in the front door was what goes on is what goes on your plate and we used to say that welcome is the first word you'll hear when you come and the feeling that we hope you leave with we also spent my extracurricular activities was spent mostly on mental health and hospitality over the last few years uh, March hit we closed on March 15th and realized that uh, there were anti chefs empty restaurants hungry people and farms with food that wasn't getting sold. So on March 23rd, we just started cooking. 
along with some other folks in town at the group loosely called Family Meals Sacramento. Uh, we started with 400 meals the first day, uh, went up to about 800 for a while doing that and continue that work. Uh, the poor guys that came in on Monday said, we're prepping for tomorrow. I said, no, we're prepping for 3.30. So the first day we did 400 meals in five and a half hours. And we've continued to do it. And again, thanks to uh, not only the people on this panel, but so many others uh, who have really helped uh, move forward and helped with uh, hunger and a lot of issues. It's a scary time and been scary for the restaurant too. But we're going to get out of it. We'll get to the other side. Nate Bentham. Hi. Um... I first want to echo the thanks to the James Beard Foundation for inviting us and for their advocacy on behalf of the FEED Act. I want to thank all the panelists, actually. I know it would not have happened or been included in the president's executive order without your advocacy. and We can't do this without you. Um, so uh, as Ashley had said, um, I'm the legislative assistant for Congressman Thompson that handles FEMA and disaster response. So my priorities shifted a little in the way that the disaster changed since COVID, right? We shifted gears to respond to this public health crisis, but before that I was mostly working on wildfire response from California. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about the FEED Act. We're, we were ecstatic to see it included in the executive order and we're hopeful to see you know, it actually hit the ground and make an impact soon here. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking with all of you. Great, and I am uh, Nate Mook. I'm the CEO of World Central Kitchen. We are a nonprofit organization founded uh, back in 2010 by a chef, a chef named Jose Andres. Um, and Jose really founded the organization to see how chefs in the culinary industry could play a role in solving some of the challenges the world faces around food. Um, you know, he felt that. You know, as we look to to some of the big problems around the world when it comes to, say, a medical crises, you know, who do you send in? Of course, you send in doctors. And yet when it comes to food crises, we're not always sending in those that know the most about food. So uh, that was the original founding of the organization since 2010. Uh, it's evolved quite a bit. Um, and in 2017, we really started to work on uh, disaster response. So responding to communities in times of crisis to make sure they had fresh, healthy, nutritious food to eat, showing that we don't have to be going out and distributing MREs to people who really should not be eating MREs, uh, but can we can give them fresh, healthy meals. Um, and so uh, since about 2017, we've served over 50 million meals uh, around the world, uh, fresh cooked meals. Um, the you know, we tend to work uh, heavily in response to um, hurricanes. We spend a lot of time in Nate B's neck of the woods responding to wildfires, um, you know, volcanoes, earthquakes all around the world. Uh, but the pandemic has really been a, a new type of disaster, right? That that none of us have, have ever had to face before. And one that is um, that is everywhere. One of the things that we do as an organization is really focus on activating local resources, so working with local restaurants, local chefs, wherever we are, um, tapping into the local food supply chain wherever we can, buying from local farmers. Um, sometimes that's not possible if there's a lot of destruction. But in the case of, of the pandemic, you know, the, the infrastructure was still there. It was just uh, unable to be utilized. And so we really had to shift our approach. Um, we also, as a small nonprofit, can't be everywhere, and the pandemic was certainly uh, impacting a lot of this country. And so very early on, we launched a program that we call Restaurants for the People. We've activated close to 3,000 restaurants all around uh, the United States. Uh, and instead of World Central Kitchen doing the cooking, paid those restaurants to prepare the meals, which in turn would keep staff employed, uh, keep them buying from their local suppliers, and then we would help distribute those meals out into the community working with uh, local partners and cities and states and you know wherever wherever we could to identify those families in need. Uh, to date, uh, since in the past year, we've put about um, just over $150 million that we've been able to inject back into small businesses, restaurants uh, to provide meals. Um, 
it feels like a lot for a small nonprofit, but we know the scale of this disaster is is much larger than that, and that really is what led to this work on the Feed Act. So um, we're excited about sort of the next stages of this. This is a really great step forward. There's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of unknowns. I don't want to you know make it sound like we've we've solved everything, but this is a step in the right direction, an exciting step, and one that I think could also um, you know now now is definitely an opportunity for the industry at large to really step in and, and play a role in helping us get to where we need to be. So thank you so much for having me today. Well, thank you again, all of you for being here and for doing the amazing work that you are doing out in the wider world. Uh, so let's, you know, let's start with the Feed Act. Uh, Nate Bentham, if you could, so I know the Feed Act was first introduced last year and now we're seeing it back. And I've heard so many things. I've heard the Feed Act in, you know, the relief bill, executive orders. Could you break all this down for us? What is the Feed Act, and where are we on it? You know, how how far along are we in making this happen? So essentially, the Feed Act is a FEMA fund reimbursement plus up, essentially, um, and it was born in the last year in the 116th Congress. And what we took was this blueprint put out by the state of California in their Great Plates program, which some of you may be familiar with, and they received approval from FEMA for quote unquote emergency food deliveries. So we realized that FEMA can approve emergency food deliveries under the Stafford Act, which is their major emergency response bill, essentially. Um, so we looked at that and said, well, we went to the state and said, well, why is this so limited, right? Why is it only senior citizens? And why can't we do this everywhere? And one of the things they pointed to was the cost share makeup, which is a 75-25 federal split, meaning that the federal government would pay the state 75% of the cost of the program, but not the state would have to come up with 25%. As everyone on this call, I'm sure, is aware, state and local city and county governments um, are really feeling the pain in the co in this pandemic. Um, their budgets are stretched. They are making tough decisions, especially at the local level. You know, we have cities that reserves are completely depleted. We have counties that are struggling to, you know, support their uh, public employees. So we looked at this and said, you know, with our experience with wildfires, we've had success in upping the federal cost share to 90-10. We said, you know, feeding people shouldn't the state, city, county shouldn't have to choose between their budget and feeding people, people in need. Um, so we wrote this bill to increase the federal cost share for emergency food deliveries to 100% um, during the co for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, like you alluded to, we had uh, great success both bicameral with our wonderful partners in the Senate and um, that now Vice President Harris originally and uh, Senator Tim Scott and this Congress when we reintroduced with wonderful um, Senator Murphy and then Senator Scott again. So we were able to successfully get it into some versions of the COVID relief packages, the HEROES Act most notably. Um, unfortunately, that didn't have very much traction. So we recalibrated, worked with our amazing partners in the House. I mean, I can't speak more highly of our FEMA chairman or FEMA of jurisdiction chairman, TNI chair uh, DeFazio. He's been just such an ally. And we organized this uh, letter essentially. So it was a formal letter with many, multiple chairs in the House um, Appropriations Chair DeLauro, Chair DeFazio, my boss, Homeland Security Chair uh, Thompson as well, Benny Thompson. And um, the last week of January, we sent it to President Biden asking him to enact essentially the FEED Act, but in a broader way, Mr. DeFazio included some other emergency measures in an executive order. That came in on February 2nd, thankfully, um, which means that FEMA now is in the process of rolling out its guidance for cities, counties, and states to utilize this 100% reimbursement. So the idea would be that cities and counties apply to FEMA, formulate a plan that works best for their community, apply to FEMA, by partnering with restaurants, nonprofits, ag producers, supply that plan to FEMA, apply for funding reimbursement, and FEMA would approve that funding. Um, right now, unfortunately, you know everything at the federal government is so slow 
um, we are waiting on FEMA to kind of release that guidance. We have been getting staff to staff contact on, from FEMA being they are going to allow a very broad interpretation of the FEED Act. Uh, most recently, they said that partnering with fisheries and coastal towns is acceptable, at least on a staff to staff level. Um, but once formal guidance is out, we're expecting, you know, hopefully very swift action and quickly being able to roll this out. Um, yeah, so I would highly encourage that's kind of the rundown of where we are with the feed. But my biggest advice on how to utilize something like this is for industry folks on the ground that know what's going on and can really help um, to start the conversation with their local governments, either city, county, and um, begin to like say that money is out there. This is approved. The president made this executive order, which included the Feed Act. And, um, you know, they, they can start contacting their state emergency operations, I think California with Cal OES, or FEMA directly and start the conversation about uh, getting this funding. Thank you. All right. And because because you brought up Great Plates, we're actually going to kind of maybe, I think, go go narrow our focus a little bit to California, and then we're going to bring it out and, you know, come back to, to Monica and Nate Mook. Um, so, Patrick, I'm going to pitch this one to you. Uh, as you've been in California, you're based in Sacramento, you, I, I believe you've been, you know, you've been doing this sort of work. What has that, that been like for you, working with your state and local government? How did you manage that? And what have, has the effects been? What have you been able to accomplish? So we, when we started with the empty restaurants and anti, anti cooks, <clears throat> excuse me, we knew that we couldn't be together, right? The hardest part for restaurants is how do you not have a bunch of people jammed together in a kitchen, right? And so our cooking and what we discovered after the first two or three weeks was that every restaurant could do four to 800 meals a day easily with social distancing and attention to food safety and to make things taste good because that's the stuff that we do all the time. Um, when we sat down, we said, here's the need and we should start feeding. I was wrong in uh, thinking that there wouldn't be a generous support from people in Sacramento. They've actually contributed in small donations enough for over 150,000 meals. Um, share our strength, all sorts of other people have you know, been, been generous as well. As, as we began to get traction, we heard that the governor also, the FEMA stuff that Nate's talking about, was, was coming to fruition. Uh, our mayor is uh, active as well. We're seven blocks from the Capitol. It's easy for people to jump over and physically see what we're doing. The governor came to see what 800 meals looks like coming out of a restaurant and banquet hall. And it was, he came the day, it turns out, that FEMA had approved uh, their, their funding. Our mayor had already uh, agreed to find the 5%. My understanding is that definition is liberal. And so 20 days later in Sacramento, uh, we were feeding 750 seniors a day, uh, three, meals, three meals, seven days a week. Um, we, we, it's a bunch of chefs and we're all tight. You guys all know being in the restaurant industry, how this works. And so what we said was, this boat is gonna help us all float. So today there are 40 restaurants in the city of Sacramento and we each do about 125 uh, meals a week with a really nice reimbursement. The reimbursement comes to us at, I think it's $66 is the, is the total. Restaurants get 58, <clears throat> excuse me. At the beginning we heard, you know, we know that school meals are 250 or less, which is really embarrassing uh, to feed someone with. We paid ourselves 450 in the beginning per meal, lots of generous donations. Nyman Ranch continues to be supportive. Superior Farms gave us 4,800 pounds of frozen lamb vindaloo. Uh, we had a tractor trailer literally of frozen hamburger patties from in and out although I don't know that they, that's public. Um, so we got great support and it was easy to do financially. When Great Plate started with that reimbursement of essentially $20 a meal, support came from Karen Ross, the secretary, our Secretary of Food and Ag, who said, hey, Chef, the reason, you know, we support you, you're doing good work. The reason I'm pushing for this reimbursement is because I know that people in California will support local farmers and industries. One of our local produce companies has uh, a cut sheet of 50 local farmers that they support on a regular basis. 
and that support went even up to Cisco, who to this day still creates a cut sheet of California grown products for people who are involved in the Great Plates program up and down the state of California, which I think is about 20 million meals uh, in all the jurisdictions that, that are sharing it. Thank you. And we're getting some great questions in, and we're going to try to save some of these for the end, but I think we'll probably address some of them as we go as well. Um, so, Monica, I'm going to move this over to you. Um, why has it been important for Share Our Strength to support the Feed Act? And how, how has Share Our Strength been working with the chefs in your network on this issue? Great question, Ashley. Um, you know, you think we know how to do this by now. Um, I, I think, you know, it was important for us to um, support the FEED Act because we should not allow children to go hungry during this time and their families. This has been a really challenging time for a lot of families across the country. We know that about, you know, more than you know, 17 million children um, are facing food insecurity, and that's a that's really appalling if you think about it. That children are wondering where their next meal is going to come from. We know that schools and community partners have done an amazing job of feeding children through the school meals program, and we commend all of their efforts. But that's still not enough. We need more um, support to help feed children. And so wherever we can find and build on innovative partnerships and make sure that we're filling the gaps, we're gonna be there to ensure that children have access to food. I wanna build on something that both um, Patrick and Nate mentioned. One thing is, is that, you know, this is about removing barriers. And, you know, as cities are in, and localities are really trying to figure out what the priority is and, Every single one of them needs to be a priority, but so does feeding children and families. We need to make that a big priority. So I think what the Feed Act does is it removes that barrier and that financial constraint for a lot of localities. So that is something that Share Strength focuses on. We have a Center for Best Practices that works with our community partners and our school nutrition providers to remove barriers. So I think, you know, it was obvious that we needed to really um, get behind and support this bill. The other piece I want to build on is bipartisanship. Um, this is a bipartisan bill, and I think the one thing we can agree on is that feeding children is a bipartisan issue. There is nothing partisan about that, that we need to work to feed children, because the long-lasting consequences of not feeding children are too great for our country and for our economy. The other thing I want to build on a little bit is that um, you know, when you think about, and I think what Patrick shared was really important is that, and Nate said this as well, is that, you know, this is a pandemic um, and this is a national health disaster, unlike anything we've ever seen. So unlike a natural disaster where you have a geographic area and where we kind of have some sort of a time parameter around it, we don't for the pandemic and as much as you know, Patrick and others have been the beneficiary of charitable contributions. It's not sustainable. Um, and, you know, we feel like there should be some commitment um, from our government to really help um, its people and to help our society during this really tough and difficult time. And so we're always advocating for ways that we can make sure that we're filling those gaps that we're feeding children. Um, there are a lot of children who are being raised by grandparents. So to the extent that we're feeding all vulnerable people, that's really important. And I think going forward, we wanna make sure that we're identifying those policy solutions that really help us to address the need immediately. You know, for Share Strength, we have um, many culinary partners um, from the time that Share Strength was founded and we know that restaurants and chefs and the culinary community has been on the front line of not just this particular disaster, but many disasters. Um, they have been there. And I think as Patrick and others have said, is, you know, 
they know how to feed people. Um, they've been doing this all day long, right? You know, so you know, why not take advantage of that expertise? And I think the one thing that we have learned through this pandemic is that there are innovations and that there are people and expertise out there that we should really tap into. And that business as usual and the way we've always approached things, um, maybe we need to take a second look at that and think about are there other opportunities that we can learn from that hopefully going forward that, um, you know, Nate and and all the other legislators who've really supported the Speed Act won't have to do this again, but maybe there's a way going forward that we make this some kind of a permanent authorization that will allow for communities, localities to partner with restaurants to step in and be a complement to all the ongoing efforts to help feed um, children and families. Thank you, Monica. And what what you said, I've I've heard reiterated by uh, chef owners, kind of honestly, since the pandemic began, is who are, who are participating in these community feeding programs. Is the donations are great, but they eventually run out, unfortunately. Um, so you know, looking for new sources of funding can be really difficult. Um, Nate Mook, I'm going to go to you. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about the work that World Central Kitchen has been doing, you've been you know doing you know disaster relief work for for quite a while. Um, and and what the Feed Act means for you and the way that you work with the restaurants that you work with across the country. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, we've been, as I mentioned, we've been engaging with restaurants uh, since very early on in this pandemic, um, starting in in March. And, you know, what we saw, as, as Patrick mentioned, is, you know, restaurants play a critical role in the communities that in which they, they operate. Um, their employers, their centers of culture they're just they're you know they're they make up the fabric right of of where we live and i think we've seen that um especially in in those early days and and in some places still in in a lot of our country uh, a lot of restaurants you know really had to completely reinvent the way that they operate um you know indoor dining has only just returned um and even only a certain percentage in certain places some places it, there's still no indoor dining um you know the the biggest job losses uh that were seen during this pandemic were in the food and beverage industry and you know thousands and thousands of restaurants have closed probably never to return again and so um, but but I, I think when you sort of get through some of the negativity, what you see is 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 some of the amazing stories that have come out of this. The restaurants that have um, that that have stepped up to serve, um, that have you know sacrificed um, and really done whatever they can to support their local communities and restaurants. I think we've seen how strong restaurants can be as part of the solution. Um, and from the very beginning, this is something that we've been a very strong advocate for, that um, let's put restaurants back to work to feed our country. We know hunger, as Monica mentioned, is at unprecedented levels. Um, and there's a lot being done to address that. But putting restaurants back to work, employing people, keeping the businesses operating um, is a really smart way to, to do that. And we've really seen our work not as going in and trying to replace all of the business that a restaurant would have right and you know patrick mentioned some of the numbers that they're working on in in sacramento these are not numbers that will sustain an entire business on their own but where i think this this is a really powerful solution is that it can be a bridge um you know from this period that we're in right now where where restaurants are not operating at full capacity they've had to lay off a lot of staff you know even if they brought some back, they're still a lot lower than probably they were in, in January of 2020. Um, so, you know, I think what we really see this as an opportunity to, uh, to keep the businesses going, to keep the restaurants operational, to keep the, the line cooks hired, to keep, you know, to rehire front of house staff to now help package up, you know, boxes, because obviously we now have to do, we have every meal has to be individually packaged, of course, for COVID safety. You know, they've, you know, we've seen, you know, that sort of ability for this approach, the Feed Act, the the model that has become the Feed Act, to really play that sort of bridge between where, you know, uh, this difficult time, and then hopefully once we get to a place in the months ahead, 
but we know it's going to be a little while, right? We know that we're, you know, yes, things are looking up. We've got vaccinations going, but there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, there's news out of New York today about a new variant that's spreading very dramatically in New York City. Don't want to get negative, but again, we, we, my point is we still have a long road ahead. Um, the FEED Act, the language that was in President Biden's presidential action, um, is applicable through the end of September. So, you know, even though things are starting to stabilize, we're looking, you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I still think this is a really powerful approach to solve uh, some of the issues that, that our country is facing right now. And I think to, to Monica's point, this, you know, my hope, our hope uh, is that this model, we've we've shown the importance that restaurants play in our communities, not only as you know the things I mentioned around employers and uh, the cultural fabric, but also they can play a role in times of crisis. And we need to think of them as a resource and to activate them when needed. And so I think you know, as we come out of this moment, what has been developed with the FEED Act can be something that lives on in future disasters. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Texas uh, just faced a, a major crisis this past week. You might, you might have, you might have been aware. Um, you know, for a number of days, and and still remains a big challenge in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, we at World Central Kitchen, because of our relationships with the restaurants that we had established during the pandemic, and some of our other work, we were able to very quickly get dozens of restaurants uh, up, up and cooking meals, uh, preparing meals that then were going out to some of the community that didn't have power, that didn't have running water. We set up community distribution sites in Austin, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, um, and restaurants played a central role in all of this. And so I think, you know, we're, this is a, this is a smart solution and this can be something that can live on even beyond the pandemic. But of course, right now, we now need to get to the next phase of this during the pandemic. Right. We have so many questions rolling in that I'm going to start to get to the questions so that we can get to as many as we can. I'm going to try to direct these appropriately. But if I if I direct something to, to Nate, Mook and Monica, you're like, oh, I have something to add on to that. Just feel free to wave at me. Um, we can definitely do that. And, you know, if the if the answer is we're still waiting on clarification from FEMA on that or oh, I've got a great link that will help explain that better. We can do that. We can share links out in the chat. Uh, just let me know and we can facilitate that. Um, so this is one that came up a lot. And I, Nate Bentham, I think I think this and several others are going to be for you. Um, and I think this is more of a clarifying point. So these FEMA funds, will they go directly to nonprofits and restaurants or will they go through state, local, municipal governments? And my understanding is it's the latter will go through state, local, municipal governments. And when states are so cash strapped and it's a reimbursement, do you have any insight to help folks advocate for those funds? And I'll hand that to Nate Bentham. Well, so uh, yeah, you you are exactly right that it, this is part of FEMA. Most disaster is public assistance, which means that it has to be go through a public entity like a city or a county or a state. Um, the second half of that question, I think, is important to distinguish that this has to be an application to FEMA for emergency food delivery. So they, if they apply under that you know, umbrella term, they can't use the money for you know, setting up a vaccination site. It has to go to food um, emergency deliveries or uh, providing emergency food. So um, you know, that goes back to what I said originally of like, start the conversation now, whether it be your local city council member, your city manager, or your county or state officials, trying to, you know, get them the information that this fund, these funds are out there now with this executive order. And we, sh we are here to support you and help you as much as we can. Um, I mean, just today, we sent our, the FEED Act co-lead sent a formal letter to Acting Administrator Fenton of FEMA, um, you know, requesting clear guidance for cities, counties, and states so that they can get the information from FEMA and say, you know, this is how you get access to these funds so we can get them out the door. Yeah, and, and I just want to add on to what Nate B was saying um, in that uh, this this does require um, the, the local municipality to take that proactive action 
So one of the best things that restaurants can do now is to start outreach. Um, some, you know, World Center Kitchen has been doing this as well over the past number of months, um, working with engaging with a number of cities and states um, and counties to kind of educate them and, and get the ball rolling on some of this. But nothing is going to be as powerful as hearing from their constituents, right? Like contacting your city council and saying, hey, you know, I've heard that this just happened and other places in the United States are taking advantage of this. Why aren't we? We, you know, there are hungry people and we have businesses that that need to be supported right now. So I think that, you know, yes, it does have to go through the cities or the counties and local local state governments, but um, there are there's a there's a key role that I think restaurants can definitely play right now in that sort of pressure and outreach to, to get the ball rolling. And as you're building, <clears throat> you should reach out to everybody, right? The uh, executives in the in there, but also the elected officials. Our experience was that that people working in governments frequently said, ick more work and would let it drop. That politicians, when you said, you are feeding seniors who all vote, and this is a good thing, was much more effective to bring everyone together. And that's state, local, and and everyone all together. And the reason that restaurants are effective is because if you think about what we do is we buy food, we prepare food, we package food, which means that the only things left to do are to transport it to the place where hungry people are and to pay for it. 10 months in, we're pretty good at transporting too. And finding hungry people is not a problem. And thanks to folks like Congressman Thompson, hopefully paying for it won't be a problem either. One of the things that we've also done um, at Share Our Strength is to also reach out to some of those key um, local associations, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Association of Governors, or National Governors Associations, and I promise you that the governors were paying attention to this. So I think that, you know, also, you know, some of that advocacy directly to some of those associations who can also help get the word out to these localities and to the counties and to the governor's office to make sure that they're also being really supportive and, and you know, paying attention that this is something they should really tap into. I, I think one key thing that I would also emphasize is that, you know, people are tired. Um, these school nutrition directors have been at it since, you know, since last March and through the summer. And so when these schools need, you know, to shut down because of a COVID case or because, you know, their staffing is not keeping pace with the demand, you know, these are not high paying jobs either. And so, you know, we know that when they need a respite, you know, we know in certain areas that these restaurants have stepped in and have worked collaboratively with schools to help them continue to meet the needs of children consistently. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's really important to acknowledge the role that restaurants have played during this pandemic and and that you know we understand um, how important it is that we bring every single resource and asset that we have to the table and i'm going to throw this one to, to monica or nate though or nate mook although patrick or nate bentham you're also welcome to weigh in um could you talk about you know you you are both represent federal large national nonprofits. Um, can you talk a little bit about how a restaurant could benefit from a uh, either a large national nonprofit partnership who's working on this, or even a city or state local local smaller nonprofit who's interested in getting involved with this? Could you talk about that restaurant nonprofit relationship and how it might be possible um, for that nonprofit relationship to help facilitate this and help you know in any way it can? Yeah, you know, so much of what we do at the national level is to help um, advocate for policy solutions like this one um, that open the doors and make it possible for these innovative partnerships. So, you know, at Share Strength, we're always happy to work with, um, you know, the restaurant community to identify ways in which they can, you know, partner, um, you know, with us to help feed kids. Um, but I would also suggest that they work also at the local level, because that's where a lot of this is going to happen is at the local level. 
And I think, you know, Patrick can share a little bit about how important it is to work within your community and, you know, with that partnership. Of course, there's all the national organizations like Meals on Wheels and Feeding America and all of us who work um, really hard, but really zeroing in on what the need is in your community and working with those nonprofits and um, your community leaders to figure that out is really critical. It's a big first step. Yeah, and, and I'll add on that. I think there are some great examples um, of of local nonprofits. I mean, this is a, this is new, right? What we're what we're sort of doing here is a bit uh, we're we're pioneering a bit, so to speak, right? And so this is yes, there have been approved programs like uh, the Great Plates program in California, which was was limited in scope. Um, but but what we're doing here, sort of looking at broadening this and taking advantage of the 100% cost share reimbursement, is new. Um, but there are some groups that have been doing amazing things locally that are um, you know, that, that are smaller. I mean, obviously the the, the coordination that Patrick was talking about in Sacramento. Uh, we were just down in Austin. There's a great local organization called Good Work Austin um, that's been really taking the charge in in the city. Uh, bring together a lot of restaurants and then and then getting food out to to um, working with the school district and others to get food out um, to distribute to families. So it doesn't have to be a, a large nonprofit. Now, I will say that you know we we want to be very clear and and realistic here. Um, you know the the biggest challenge. I'll give you an example. So uh, where we've been working in California, where the Great Plates program was operating. Uh, we we started uh, last year um, when this was was rolled out last spring, the end of last spring. Um, the first checks are just getting to cities in California from FEMA. So we're talking six, seven months before they've gotten their checks in the mail from FEMA. Now, hopefully this will start to speed up as things get you know a little bit more normalized. But you can imagine waiting for seven months to get paid. Um, so this is a challenge on a couple of fronts. One is that um, even if we're only talking about, let's say we're talking about one month or two months, imagine how many restaurants can do business and not get paid for two months for that business and yet still have to buy all the food and supplies and every all of their costs. Cities, unfortunately, have been facing the same problem that even with 100% cost share reimbursement, you know, they don't have money in their budgets that they can sort of float the difference until and make the payments until the money from FEMA comes in. Now, it's different everywhere. Some cities are doing better than others, but overall that is a big challenge. So this is where the role of an organization like World Central Kitchen can come into play, where we can kind of in some ways serve as that coordination, that sort of middleman, so to speak, but using our sort of position to be able to work with directly with the restaurants, which is what we've been doing, um, and interfacing with the city and sort of being able to tie it over by we can pay the restaurant so the restaurant doesn't have to wait for that public money to come in. So this is going to be something that we're going to be figuring out in the weeks ahead um, and it is going to be one of the challenges that, you know, because restaurants, when they, they need to make payments, they need to make payments. They can't wait around for FEMA to take six months to pay them. And so this is something that will be needed to be worked out. But this is where larger nonprofits may be able to play a role here and partner with the counties and the cities and the restaurants to make this a little bit more seamless um, than, than otherwise. And, and we've had that, that challenge in Sacramento County where there's a smaller city who had to drop out of Great Plates because they couldn't hold the nut to make the payment first. State of California was pretty good about putting money out, at least in Sacramento, uh, pretty quickly. And then Ashley, to your question about what small restaurateurs can do in terms of, of large, large nonprofits and how they help. I mean, World Central Kitchen, super inspirational, right? When we started in March, having no idea what we were doing, that's a great place to look at. For us, it was super important. And then uh, can't short sell James Beard Foundation, Share Our Strength, so many other nonprofits who came in to help us and support us so that as we go back out and have those conversations and say, hey, Share Our Strength is with us, James Beard Foundation is helping, World Central Kitchen is on the same bus, we're all trying to help feed people. When you go to Nate's boss or go to other people, that just really helps uh, sell the argument too. 
And then the last piece I'd say on that is don't sell yourself short as, as the chef or owner of a person who is running something that's essential or vital or so loved in the community that you have a voice. And we spend so much time in the restaurant business giving out gift certificates for people's charities and this and that and softball leagues and everything. Time to cash it in. Time to stand up and say, we have been good partners with you throughout our entire existence in the community. Here is a challenge and we need your help and we'd like you on board. And the last piece is, while we're doing this for emergency, right, like Nate said, and they're geared towards that, for me, the inspiration from Share Our Strength is the idea that everyone should go to bed well fed. And the hope is that as we come through the other end of the pandemic, that because of this kind of programming, that we'll be able to say, yes, we should feed school children and their families. No one should go to bed hungry. And we should reimburse the people who are doing the work to see that that food goes out in an equitable manner. And for that, we have the World Central Kitchen to thank as a great model. I'm just going to gonna say that um, I think I'm a little concerned that Patrick Mulvaney um, might be competing for my job. So thank you, Patrick, <laughs> for all those kind words. I'm getting concerned then. <laughs> uh, to, to Patrick's point, I, I could not agree more. I mean, this was really born, this bill was born out of, you know, my boss hearing from restaurants in the community that he is he frequents that he is friends with the restaurateurs like he it was born out of him seeing and hearing from people on the ground and at least speaking from my experience with the co-leads of the feed act and my own boss like they want to hear from you and it's so important to have your voices be heard by them um and i would say because this is federal dollars i mentioned talking to your city county and state but also talk to your federal representatives. This is federal dollars and they should be communicating to the other local electeds that this money's out there. And there is no voice more important than the voice of a constituent. And, you know, I've had the benefit of and the honor of having chefs join me in some of my Hill meetings. And, you know, they remind, um, you know, Hill offices all the time um, that they are the backbone of some of their communities as um, local business owners and employers and partners in the community. So, you know, your voice is so incredibly important. And, you know, Share Strength welcomes anybody who wants to always join us for our Hill meetings or our virtual lobby day. So, absolutely. And staff, 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 <clears throat> as you reach out, do not the importance is the staffers that are there. People like Nate who return your call, super important. And also the idea of Nate's right, man, using, we have used our congressional delegation to push back down into the city and county when we think that they're not moving as fast as they should. A call to our Congresswoman, Mrs. Matsui or Congressman Berra to call back in. And even quite frankly, to Congressman LaMalfa who is, represents an agricultural district to be able to say to him that this is about saving farmers and about creating economic development tools means that someone who is an unlikely partner now has joined us in the game and pushing back down into the community can help make this stuff work better. Okay, so to summarize some of the amazing things I'm hearing before moving on to a few other questions. Um, and some of the questions I think we don't have clarification on yet, just to kind of preview that for anyone, because we're getting some real real detailed questions, which are great, but I think those answers maybe don't exist yet. So I hope that we'll be able to have another one of these webinars um, once that clarification comes out from FEMA, once that guidance comes out from FEMA, we'll be able to answer some of these questions that are more detailed. But so my understanding is I want to make sure and correct me if I'm wrong, definitely call me out. Uh, so we had we had the Feed Act and then the executive order happened. So those funds have been approved. They're there. They're going to be there. There's kind of nothing left to pass there except for figuring out what that guidance looks like. So in while we're waiting for that guidance and we don't really have a timeline on that, hopefully it'll happen sooner rather than later. But FEMA is super busy right now. Um, a good thing for if I'm a chef or a restaurateur, where I can start right now, as I'm thinking about this, I can start to have those conversations with my city government, 
uh, with my municipal, with my county, and with my state leaders. Did I miss anyone in those lists of who should I really target in my, in my outreach as I'm starting to think about this? And also, I'm going to say, as a restaurant, I should also start thinking about local nonprofits that can help facilitate this and identify the need, whether a, a small nonprofit or I think Monica, as you mentioned, uh, I think Shara Strength has been doing a lot of work with, um, with school food, so with, with lunch feeding and where that might be appropriate. Fill in any giant holes that I left or any huge errors that I made. I think the yeah. only thing that I'll add, um, Ashley, is that, um, you know, I th there, while we are, yes, we are waiting for um, some more detailed guidance from FEMA. Um, unfortunately, I, I will say that oftentimes some, the, the way that FEMA works is they are reactive, not proactive. And what I mean by that is they will respond to, uh, th this guidance may end up coming out of the process of um, applications going in from cities and states as they approve them, which then starts to create a standard. Um, the other challenge just on the FEMA front, uh, you may or may not be aware, but our, uh, FEMA is still in transition. Uh, there's a new administrator coming in. There's a lot happening at that level um, right now. So, um, and we just had a huge disaster in Texas. So my, my only addition to that is cities or counties don't need to wait to start this process, right? If it's something that they want to be participating in, they can get the ball rolling now. Um, they can also start an application process to FEMA now. Um, you know, put, put together a project application proposing this work. And again, as you mentioned, Ashley, with restaurants working with local nonprofits or larger nonprofits, or, you know, figure out how to plug in restaurants in there and put together a proposal to FEMA specifically for this type of work. So even, even if guidance might still be some weeks away, there's still steps that can be taken now, if especially if cities or counties are willing to move quickly. All right, and so we, we do actually have some other, some nonprofit folks on this call as well. And so I'm gonna hand this one to, to either uh, Monica or Nate M. Is, is there a place where nonprofits, local nonprofits who would either like to be connected to learn best practices from other nonprofits that are engaged in this space that are specifically working on feeding communities in need. Is there is there some place they can go to resources or to connect or if they want to, you know, start partnering with restaurants, is there a is there a local nonprofit network? I, I wasn't sure if Nate or Monica, if you had any resources that you could share. Yeah, we have, outside of working with Patrick, there are a few other partners that we have worked with on feeding um, the community. And so we would be happy to um, follow up and talk with them individually about um, some of the different models and ways in which, um, you know, um, this these partnerships have worked to feed um, communities. So I think it really depends just on terms of just you know, kind of whether you're working with a school, whether you're working with a nonprofit, the type of population that you're feeding, because they all have different needs and requirements. And so I think we're happy um, to, to share what some of those best practices have been. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, because as I mentioned, this is all kind of new new territory. There isn't, uh, and we're still waiting again on on very clear FEMA guidance on this. Um, there isn't, uh, unfortunately, some, you know, sort of like, here's the steps and the processes and things like that. We're hoping to have something together in the next week or two um, that can be shared more publicly, sort of showing, okay, here's how we've gone about doing it. And if you want to take an approach, you know, here's, here's a model that you can follow. Um, I, I hope that we'll continue to get more clarity. Uh, you know, Nate B's team um, and Mike Thompson's office and others are working hard uh, from the congressional side, pushing uh, the administration and FEMA to, to to get this rolling. And I think, you know, one, one of the key things I do want to mention is that, um, you know, President Biden uh, is a big supporter of this idea um, in the intent. You know, he's come out and said, we're going to put our restaurants back to work to feed our communities 
Um, and so this is what this is the intent of the administration. And this is so now it's just about that sort of trickling down, so to speak, to the actual you know nuts and bolts on the ground of of the work. So. Um, Anybody can reach out to us, reach out to, to us at World Central Kitchen. We're happy to chat. Um, we're happy to share some of the things. And then we hope to have something a little more formal together in the next couple of weeks as some of these things kind of coalesce uh, and we get we get further clarity. Thank you. And happy to have them reach out to me, too, if they want. Just given the, you know, we're doing the Great Plates Delivered. We feed COVID uh, patients. We're feeding school children and their families and then also uh, uh, college students that are that are stuck with no resources and each of those has their own nonprofits that we're engaged with so not formal but happy to help thank you and i see a lot of these questions are coming in how much what's the reimbursement per meal how does this work what's a reimbursable expense are there nutrition limits i, I, I my understanding is that we'll we'll probably get a better sense of that as the weeks go by and we get guidance from fema is that is that correct nate or one of one of our nates sounds good um so yeah, we'll I would, kind of, go ahead, I would just add on the regulatory side and this is true for usda as different plans go in and as they continue to approve different plans what you end up finding is that the agencies will often issue a q a um, that also serves as guidance you know as they get more um applications and different ideas of different partnerships so on the one hand we do want guidance from fema we don't want it to be so rigid that it doesn't um you know constrain some you know partnerships that could be really interesting and innovative so sometimes what you'll find is that the agencies will often do a q a once they've approved a certain number of um, plans and and requests Thank you. Um, that, that helps a lot. Uh, and so just one more time to clarify. So this, these funds can either go through local government or state government. So I can talk to both my local city government as well as my, my like state assemblyman. Is, is, that, is that correct, Nate? Nate B? Yeah, I, I think this is monica i would just say that i think you know talk to everyone right talk to your city councilman talk to your um you know talk to your mayor talk to your state representative talk to everybody because you know the squeaky wheel gets the grease and so i think it's really critical but i would certainly focus on your mayors and your city council members and then of course your state reps often help with the governor's office so you know, I would say, you know, talk to as many people as you have access to to help you, you know, begin to move um, the process and to to raise awareness. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that the the actual FEMA application will likely be coming from your local city or county, um, but it will flow through and a lot of states have a state level uh, uh, kind of review. Um, so just a, a practical example. So we're working in Oakland, uh, the city of Oakland. Uh, the city itself is the submitter because it is its own, uh, it's, even though it's part of Alameda County, it's its own entity. The city is submitting directly to FEMA. Um, but before it does that, it goes up to the state level and gets looked at and sort of given the thumbs up. And then when it gets the thumbs up, then it goes to, to FEMA and then it will flow back through. Things can happen at the state level. You can, you could get a program more broadly that gets put together, which then gets disseminated from the state level down to the implementation in the cities and the counties. This is what happened with Great Plates. The state of California came, worked with FEMA, came up with this concept, which then became available to the local cities or counties to take advantage of. Many of them didn't. Unfortunately, there were a lot of challenges with the Great Plates program, which uh, limited uh, how the uptake on it, but um, you know the that that sort of flow of things. So I think uh, local is ultimately probably going to be the most important because they're the ones like your city or your county is going to be the ones really actually implementing this. But if you have those connections at the state level, that can be very powerful to 
help, as Monica said, you know, grease the wheels, get get more, the more pressure you can have here, the better, because one of the things we're going to be fighting against is, is the inertia, is, you know, getting somebody to do something new, take on a new task. This is crazy. Everybody's busy. There's a lot going on. You know, uh, it really needs to be seen as a win. And and I think, you know, as both Patrick and Monica mentioned, um, you know, it, it, it needs to be presented as an opportunity that, you know, in, in is going to really help and as a constituent you can put a lot of pressure um and also if they don't take advantage of it while a neighboring city or state does you know that's also going to make them look bad so you know this is this is sitting there you know ready to be utilized so now we just have to have to do it excellent thank you so much for clarifying that that really helps uh, so we are slightly over time, so I'm just going to give everyone like a minute each to say any closing remarks, closing thoughts, calls to action, whatever you want it to be. I know we tried to get to as many questions as we can. We save these afterwards, so we'll follow up where we need to. Um, we'll host any additional webinars where I see a question about nonprofit roundtables. We'll try to do as much as we're able to do in the follow up over the coming weeks and months. Uh, but yes, I want to hand it over to our amazing panel for one one kind of last parting remark each, and we're going to go uh, Monica, Patrick, Nate B, Nate M. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone, especially everyone who signed into this webinar, because I know so many of you have done some amazing work and have been partners of ours, and so we really appreciate that. And just thank everyone um, for their advocacy to push this forward because, you know, when one in four children are facing the threat of hunger, we need to do everything possible to help feed those children. No child should go to bed wondering if they're going to eat the next day. So I just want to thank everyone for all of the amazing work and leadership on this. Thank you. And this stuff works, right? I mean, it, it it feeds people, it helps keep us floating, it helps our farmers, it helps uh, lessen weight on the hospital, it helps schools. So as what I would say is my last parting piece is as you're talking to anyone interested in this, wherever they are on the spoke of the wheel, I always think about and try to convey to them why it is good for them, right? People make decisions because it's right, it's the right decision for them. So when I'm talking to people, always think about how it's going to get you reelected. It's going to have your farmers supported. It's going to feed people all at the end of the day. And then we can keep our industry alive and get back going and get back to what we do, which is hospitality and bringing people around the table to break bread and create a better tomorrow. You're on mute. You're on mute, Nate B. James Beard Foundation for, um, you know, organizing this panel. I want to thank the amazing partners that participated on this panel, and I want to thank the participants because I think, you know, you're all the ones on the ground. We're trying to get you the resources to do the great work that you are doing. Um, you know, and this fight isn't over. It doesn't stop with just this executive order. We want to push FEMA to get clear guidance out. We want to make sure that people don't go to bed hungry. It's a passion of my bosses and you know we're in it for the long haul here and so thank you all for all your work and thank you for including us yeah and i'll just uh add you know i think i want to thank everyone for um of course tuning in and and helping spread the word about this um uh and also for your patience you know this is this is a process and um you know i know i wish there Things were faster. Um, we've been we've been fighting for the Feed Act uh, since last spring, um, and this is an exciting uh, step forward. Um, even if there's a lot of work to do, and appreciate your patience and support as we're working through this. And get in touch if you have any questions. Get in touch. Um, you know, as we get this more locked in and detailed out, you know, we're, we we want to get this in a place where. Folks can take advantage of this all over the country and uh, we can get food out to folks that need it and restaurants can be supported and also buying, you know, it's not just the restaurants, right? As Patrick mentioned, it's the, it's buying from the, the suppliers and the farmers and all of, it gets the whole, the whole wheel turning again, which is so, so critical. So, um, you know, appreciate all of you and uh, we hope to continue this conversation. This is just the start. So a lot more in the weeks ahead.
Thank you so much, everyone, for attending and for bearing with us as we go a little bit over, but it's such an important topic. And thank you, Nate, Nate, Patrick, and Monica for being such amazing panelists. And, you know, that's just on top of all of the remarkable work that you're doing in your day to day. Uh, but we'll be collecting all these questions that come in. We'll try to direct them as appropriate. Uh, so keep an eye out over the next few days for that. And hopefully we'll be able to share more resources soon. But thank you again. And everyone check out Open for Good if you love this and you want to see more webinars, if you want to catch a recording of this one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.